everybody, it's your girl Bunny, Hulu's original series, Wu-Tang, an American Saga. We're gonna review and recap the first episode. Now, if you haven't looked at the necessary intro, the video before this, I deeply encourage you to look at it because that will help you understand how I review and recap in this video, all right? So here we go, episode one. Can it be all so simple? first scene that's embedded of a montage of several different things happening at one time systematically in one scene. So we start off, we see somebody young, they're in a fatigue army jacket, they're in a room full of vinyls, crates of vinyls, we see switchboards, we see turntables, and all of a sudden we hear You already know who that is. You already know who that is. I was, like, oh, I was on the couch bobbing my head. I said, somebody start rapping. Somebody call somebody. Oh my God. We can't because we cut to the next clip where we go a little bit ways down the street and we see a sign that says Park Hill Apartments that are located in Staten Island, New York. And that park part is just crossed out. Now it's Killer Hill Apartments. So we got an idea of the location of where this first person has been in this house going down the street passing some apartments. We go down a little bit ways and we see a man. He's in a van and he's waiting on somebody. He talking to somebody outside the driver window and he like, hey, where is Shy at? The dude like, oh, well, there he is right there. We see somebody going down the street, you know, they got the crooked mouth. They walking, they trying to put the crooked mouth over the gold fronts. We already know who that is. We already know who that is. He get in the car. Old dude like, hey, man, I was supposed to pick you up at your house. Where you been? He was like, we still talking. Let's go. And, you know, as they driving, he was like, look, it's going to be mad. You know, Stapleton Brothers there, man. You know, he was like, don't worry about it. Look, we trying to do this tonight. I want Dennis dead. He cut to a young brother who is at the dinner table, and he's sitting next to two younger boys. Both of them are handicapped and in a wheelchair, and he's warming up dinner. He's like, hey, I hope y'all are ready for this oatmeal. I'm cooking that up. He then goes down the hallway and he sees that his mother is passed out. She got a bottle of wine next to her and she's gone. She's in another world. So he just shakes that off and goes back into the kitchen with his little brothers. You can assume that's his little brothers. And he sits down, he's just like, hey man, I want y'all to keep reading that book. You know, the character, he's in a wheelchair just like y'all. And you know, it, it, it's just so sad to say that he fought all of these people and he got crippled because a lady, you know, shot at him and now he's in the wheelchair so as he's telling them this story you see the van pull up he's locked and loaded with a machine gun and proceeds to spray the apartment and bullets are just going all through that individual's house and when i tell you those bullets barely missed this young man who just cooked dinner grazed right in front of him where his ball is he knocks over the other little boys that are in the wheelchair so they don't get hit and he's spraying just i mean his bullets going everywhere it is a machine gun okay just spraying bullets, they skid off and drive off. He gets up, he's checking himself, he's checking his brothers that are in the wheelchair, he's pulling them back up, he's like, everybody okay? And they're like, you know, we okay, we okay. You know, they could barely talk. They go, then as he checks on them, he goes down the hall like, oh dang, I need to check on my mom. He goes in there and she has red stains on her back, her leg and he's just just standing there like oh my god and he just screams then mom then we know we have it confirmed that that's his mother and he turns her over and we already come to the conclusion that she's dead and there's red stains all across the front of her as well but when he rolls her over she says 
You waking me up now? It's not even one o'clock yet. And he sees the broken wine bottle shattered and the stains are from the wine. And he's just like, oh, like, I can't believe that everybody's okay. So he just musters up himself. He puts on a jacket. He goes into a box and gets a gun because clearly he must proceed to stop whoever the hell this was. Brothers in the van, they driving away from the crime scene, speeding off. And he's just like, hey, man, you know, um, pull me over. I, the, the, the cops is coming real quick. Let me get rid of this gun. You know, just let me out. So he gets out. He's walking down the street. He's hiding the gun. He's walking to this house. And we hear the bass line. And we hear the music coming from the bass line of this house. So we know that he's going to the character's house that we just saw that was cooking up them beats. He goes in there. He walks in. And Sha, he walking back and forth, pacing back and forth. He was like, you know, what up, Bobby? So we know the guy in the fatigue jacket is Bobby. And Bobby says, yeah, man, um, what's up? And he pacing back and forth. Dude, they just shot up the apartment. He patient. He like, what's up, man? Bobby like, hey, right, you know, man, where you just come from? You know, like, what's, yeah. Because you can see he amped up, he's sweating. It's been a serious situation. So he's just like, well, where are you coming from, man? He's just like, just had to put in work, you know? <laughs> and he's just like, all right, man, why don't you just sit down and calm down? He was like, I need you to stash something for me. So he goes into this, his backpack, and he pulls out this machine gun and hands it to Bobby. And Bobby like, well, damn, this shit's still hot. You know, uh, 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 <laughs> go ahead and have a seat. So he goes somewhere, and he stashes the gun. And he sits down, and he's trying to calm down. Bobby proceeds to play the beat. So he's playing the beat. And he just got shy. He in the chair just, just vibing, thinking of some lyrics. And he just, you know, so on, so on, so on. He think he just mumbling some stuff to go along with the beat. And, you know, you got Bobby looking at him like, I don't know what the hell just happened, but okay. And he gets up, grabs the mic. And they start recording and he flows and puts a verse down like he didn't just try to kill somebody. We cut to the next view and it's somebody there in a Chinese food restaurant. They just, they look good from head to toe. They got all the name brands on, brother even got a Rolex on. He real calm and serene. He pull out these little chopsticks so he can get ready to eat. He dust himself off, laying down his napkin. And in the background, we see this brother with all these different braids crazy over his head. And he at the counter talking to the Asian lady like, hey, look, you know, I know you cooked up that beef and broccoli, but I need some extra spicy, you know what I'm saying? She like, hey, you know, extra one dollar. He like, don't do me like that. We know who that is. You don't do me like that. Another dollar as much as I come in here? What? So, so we see that scene, and then we some, see somebody come in. They got the hat on. They mad. It's the same brother that got his apartment shot up with his family in there. He's like, man, what's going on? What's going on, man? He's like, man, calm down. What's wrong with you, Dennis? So we know Dennis. And if you a Wu-Tang fan, you know who Dennis is. But for new people, it's Dennis. And they sit down. He's like, look. F shot, F power, and F them sleep with them niggas. So he already has a clue. He already has in mind who just tried to kill him. And you know, dude at the table is like, dude, look, we gonna get back at him, just not now. We gonna wait for it to cool off and we gonna get back at him at the perfect time. Don't worry about it, I got this. He then cut to Bobby's place. The sun is up. You know, when it begins, it's nighttime. The sun is up. It's light all through that room. He is still in there. He has been in there all night long, listening to stuff, writing, producing. So that is where he's been this entire time. And as he's sitting there, he has a notepad, and he's thinking, and he's mumbling words, and he's just saying gibberish at the time. Nah, don't say it like that. Okay, let me try it. I'm in a neutral zone between two warring communities. Nah, that's too choppy. Be a little bit more real with it. All right. I'm in a neutral zone between two warring communities. And you know then, like, pow, okay, wow. He's in the middle. He is in a neutral zone between two warring communities. Stapleton 
and Park Hill because I wondered while I'm watching the scene, dang, how is he able? How is how is he able to get to Bobby's house so fast after just trying to kill somebody and shoot somebody? And I said, oh, he's right around the corner. He's like right there. So that lets us know his location. We then see Divine, okay, because when Dennis was talking at the Chinese restaurant, he said he called the man Divine. So we have an idea of who Divine is. Wu-Tang fans know who Divine is, but we hear the name Divine. So Divine walks into the basement where Bobby is and was like, man, you know, you, you been here all night? He was like, yeah. He was like, why are you not at your post, man? You're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. And he's just like, oh, you know, Bobby's like, oh, dang, it is another day. Like, he's looking and not even recognizing that it's another day. He is so in tune and in his own world with the music. So we're seeing how the writers are allowing us to see how dedicated Bobby is. And he says, look, um, it's all right, man. I forgive you. It's all right. Just, just, just get to where you're trying to go. And, you know, you need to be making money and not doing this. And he leans on the switchboard and it releases the track and we hear the the previous beat from earlier in the episode and he recognizes the voice on the track and he says so uh when did you record that bobby looks at him and says oh um we recorded that a while ago man he's like okay all right then we'll we'll, we'll get out of here and go where you need to go there's a lot of intricate details that are pretty small that happened along the episode, but I'm gonna talk about the key points. Okay, so the next thing that's a big moment is we have the guy with the crazy wild hair. We know who that is. We got Bobby and we got Dennis all on a ferry passing the Statue of Liberty going to the other side you know we we know what that's about but they're on a ferry getting ready to go to the statue of liberty so for those of you who haven't been to new york you know you have the different ferries that take you where you need to go and of course you have the statue of liberty uh, or the staten island ferry that takes you to go see the monument of the statue of liberty so as they're on the ferry you know we see dennis he talks over the shoulder of bobby he was like look I know that's your boy from way back, and I don't care if y'all go back to whenever, whatever. I know your boy Shy and, and, and them brothers over there, I know they behind me possibly getting shot up. And you know, Bobby don't have nothing to do with that. He be like, man, I don't know what you're talking about. That's y'all. I mean, I, I don't know, man. You just just don't come to me with, don't come to me with that. Get to the location where you buy tickets and all the little things that you can get to take back home when you want to see the Statue of Liberty. And they're in the building, and you got your boy with the crazy hair. We know who that is. They go. He goes to the front desk to distract the uh, counter worker. Uh, so they can talk to her because they got to talk to another employee that owed them some money. So the guy at the register is keeping the employee busy and, and, and out of the way and distracted while they talk to somebody in the back stock room. He's talking to the girl at the front and he's like, how you doing, Nubian? You know, you're like a des descendant of an Egyptian queen. You know, I'm not leaving here until you give me your number. And, you know, she he got a line all behind her and she's just looking at him like, you holding up my line, but it's all a distraction because you got Bobby and you got Dennis roughing up somebody in the back room trying to get some money that he owed them that they owe him. And they're roughing them up. They're like, hey, man, you know, you owe us this and owe us this. It's only half of the money. And we see somebody kind of like further back in a stock room. They writing down lyrics. He got a nice button up shirt and some pants. And he gets up big fro and some earbuds and he gets up. He's like, hey, man. You know, what's going on here? Y'all y'all arguing and stuff. This is work. Like, y'all need to take that elsewhere. And he's like, okay, man, you know, what's up? Um, we here to, for, to do our work. And he's like, look, all that stapling and Park Hill stuff, that's cool outside, but I'm at work. And he was like, Dennis was like, well, man, who are you? He was like the assistant manager. And we see the Clifford name <laughs> on the name tag. And we already know who that is. I'm not going to say who that is because I want y'all to grow and develop and learn who these characters are. And they're like, look, I got two minutes until my lunch is over with. All that street stuff need to go outside of the store. So y'all get out. So they get out and they slowly get out. And they're like, come on, man. They're talking to the guy at the counter like, let's go. He was like, hey, yo, shorty gave me a whole bunch of film, bruh. And they're like, you don't even got a camera, man. Come on. Before they leave, Bobby 
turns to Clifford and hands him this tape. And he's like, hey, man, you know, it's a whole bunch of beats on there. I need you to come with it. And I need you to, you know, bring your verses and stuff like that for when we get back in there. And you can see that, okay, they know each other. <laughs> As Bobby and everybody else head home. He sees a young, an older man playing chess at the table. He's like, "Man, I catch y'all later. I'ma play chess." And they're like, "Oh man, what you doing? You playing? You playing games, man? We trying to get back home." He was like, "I catch y'all later." So he sits down. Clearly, this is somebody that he always plays chess with because the older gentleman knows who he is. And when he sits down, a white man comes up to him, to Bobby, and says, "Hey man, you know, let me get a dime bag." He was like, "What?" I don't know what you're talking about, man. He was like, yeah, you know the weed? He was like, nah, you, you, you got the wrong man. <laughs> and he looking at the old man like, man, he got me messed up, mixed up with somebody else. So the white guy, he leave like, whatever. So the old man says maybe he had the wrong guy. He's like, yeah, you know, had the wrong guy. And he like, you know what? All day I just think about music. That's all I think about. It's just my own world, and I love it so much. And I want to do it all the time, but I can't. I got other stuff I need to do. And the old man says, it sounds like you're living your life doing somebody else's job. And I said, whoo, how deep is that? Living our lives doing somebody else's job. And it's like Bobby has this epiphany like, dang, you right. And he says, you need to make sure you're not living your life like that because, you know, time is short and your, your time is real short. And by the way, checkmate. <laughs> Bobby gets home and his mother wants him to go play the numbers and get a few things. So he gets home, leaves back out of the apartment, goes somewhere to play her numbers. And as he's passing all of these places in, in, in an apartment complex to play her numbers, he sees a woman getting beat by a man and he stops the man from beating her and he has a flashback of when his mother was beaten and he was a child in the background and he looks at the young boy who's who watched his mother get beat up and it's a very touching scene because he sees himself in the little boy and he breaks off that thought and he continues on to walk down the street. As he's walking down the street, he passes a music store with keyboards and stereos and beats, beat machines. And when he walks in, he hears this very crisp, well-organized beat in the background. So he heads to the back of the store and he sees this machine that everybody's playing with and fiddling with and making beats with. Bobby looks at an employee and says, hey man, you know, what is that? And he says, it's nice, huh? It's the new SP-1200. You know, it's a machine that never has a timing error and you can even do 10 seconds of a sample. Now, this machine was a game changer when it came to producing, especially hip hop. And you know, if you had to mix a song back then, you were on the turntables mixing and blending two separate vinyls to merge and one beat. And so while you were doing that, since you were doing it manually, if you were off by just a little bit, the beats would mix together and you would have to start all over again with putting the two samples together. So when Bobby sees this machine, he is just so into it and he knows he has to have it. And he says, well, how much is it? And he says, it's $2,000 to get it up out of this store. And at that moment, you know, Bobby, he looks defeated. It's a very pivotal scene because the next thing that we see, Power and Shot are talking because, you know, they're discussing this miss that they had an opportunity to kill Dennis. And he says, man, you know, he's got to be dead by the end of today we got to make sure that he's dead and you know shy he's just like you know yeah i i we gonna we gonna we gonna try to do that again you know and so he says hey man you know get in the car let me take you home he's like no nah, man it's okay i'll walk it so when he's walking we see later on in the evening that he goes to this rooftop of a building goes into a little chamber thing that's locked and pulls out a sleeping bag and some clothes so we see that he is homeless he's laying on the top of this roof with just a walkman and he's using that to help him go to sleep he's homeless he has nowhere to go 
That's why he told Power, don't walk me home. I got this. Dennis, Bobby, Divine, Bobby's two younger siblings, the brother and sister, they're about to eat dinner. The mom, which is played by Erica Alexander, she leaves to go to work and she's pulling the dub double shift and they're all talking as young people and giggling and laughing and all this other stuff. And Bobby gets up and cuts on some music and Devon says, turn that off, T just turn that off. And he was just like, well, why, why are you tripping? He's like, just turn it off. And he tells the younger kids and he tells Dennis, hey, y'all, you know, y'all gotta leave the room, we gotta talk. So Devon tells Vyrie, look, I know you into this music, but we got bills. What you trying to do is a dream that probably won't ever happen, but we got bills. That's real. Your dream is, is fake. It's not ha it's not happening right now. But the, what's, what's real is bills, the food you eating, this nice house, you got clothes. So you need to kind of put that music on the back burner to help me because we could really get something happening here with, 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 you know, getting that brick so we can get that and make a lot of money. And Bobby's like, okay, we get the money, then what? Like, what, what, what are we going to do after that? And, of course, he doesn't answer, but he's telling him, stop tripping with this music, okay? Vaughn tells Bobby, look, you are totally different. You're The way you think, everything just changed ever since you went to North Carolina. You know, you going to North Carolina, it really messed you up. And Bobby has a flashback to where he was really, really young, where he sees his mother being beaten. And we see in his vision that he had to leave and he ends up staying with his uncle. He gets he gets to a train station as a little boy and the gentleman says, hey, Bobby, do you remember me? I'm your uncle. So he's staying with his uncle. It's in North Carolina. It's in a very quiet neighborhood. They walk in. Uh, he sees that it's the time where people had JFK pictures on their wall and Martin Luther King and all of these people that we know on the wall. You could tell they're very religious. Uh, there's a white Jesus uh, little thing on the, on the dresser. And he's just looking at this place like it's a whole new world going from a super city to super country <laughs> and we have a young lady she walks in uh, or an older woman and she says well hello and Bobby says well hi and the man looks at him like I know you know better than that he's like well hello ma'am and before they even get to the house the uncle told him which is a down south thing he tells her even though that's really not south south but he tells Bobby look here when somebody walk in a room, you speak to them. You speak when spoken to. And when somebody talks to you, you say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. So understand that. So he lays those rules down, but at the same time, he comes off very gentle. And when he gets there, he gets in the bed and he keeps the light on and hears sounds of crickets and frogs and all of these things you don't hear in the city outside so he's super scared and the uncle tells him hey you got to turn that night light off and he's like all right i'm turning the lamp off and when the uncle leaves he turns the light off and he makes sure he's gone and he cuts that light right back on and we also see that he has memories that when he woke up that morning the sister is beating the crap out of him. You were told to cut the light off and you didn't cut the light off. So he's seeing violence yet again as a young boy. He was in an environment where his mother was getting abused and they're seeing it as discipline, but it's not the traditional whooping. I mean, it's being beaten. So we learn that about Bobby. Bobby, in the present day, in that present day, he is so consumed with getting that SB1200 that he goes back to that store and he tries to sneak and steal it. It is the drum machine that he needs in his life. And the same employee that was talking to him earlier says, hey man, if you put it back now, I won't tell the manager, just, just put it back. And that bit of information is very important because how would his life or how would Wu-Tang be if he went to jail and that changed his whole 
uh, idea of music. I mean, that's such a pivotal point that that gentleman says that I'm not going to call the police. I'm not going to tell anybody. If you just put it back, I won't say anything. They put that in the series for a reason. Just think how different your life would be if certain things did or didn't happen. So that not happening, him not going to jail was something very, very important. So he puts the drum machine back and leaves. So from that previous night, you know, Divine, while telling him, you know, stop messing with this music, he tells him to let you know how serious I am and how important this is. Instead of working on your music, tomorrow you need to be there at the drop so you can pick it up, okay? You need to pick that up. But the next morning, Bobby, he's still consumed in his music to where he forgets. He forgets that he needs to go to a specific place to pick up the drop. So Divine, he's like, hey man, y'all seen Bobby? He was supposed to pick up something for me and go get something for me. I'm paging him and he's not answering. And everybody like, I don't know where Bobby is, man. You know, I don't know. So Divine says, you know what? I'ma go pick this up. Don't worry about it. And he goes to the area to make the pickup. He gets the 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 items from the locker. He comes back down the stairs and you hear click click and I'm thinking um did he get shot <laughs> but he did not what ended up happening is that he ends up getting arrested so when he gets arrested we see him called to the house and you got bobby and you got dennis over there his siblings and his mom and they can't believe he got arrested and you know dennis he's just like so what we gonna do he was like you know don't worry about it you keep things going on the street while i'm in here put bobby on the phone bobby gets on the phone he was like so what you want me to do he was like look don't worry about it. I'm going to sit in here. I'm going to do what I had to do. He was just like, so what about the bail money? We're going to do this and we're going to do that. He was like, so you do bail money? We're going to lose everything that we've saved. We might lose the house. That's all the money we got. Look, don't worry about it. Don't Y'all just keep stuff going on an up and up and don't worry about me. I'm in jail. It is what it is. And on that day, we got power to tell Shy, look, um, where did you stash that gun? Um, you know, and Shy's like, you know, I dropped it off at a, you know, at a girl house she got it stashed over there he was like all right well cool go pick that up because we need that back because we need to make sure that dennis is dead we got to take care of this situation we then cut the bobby's house dennis comes over there knocks on the on the door and his little sister answers the door and she's like well what do you want she's like hey he was like hey your, your, your mom at home your, your brother at home he was real antsy and she was like, I told you that my brother wasn't here and my mom wasn't here. And he goes in. They already, they already got clearly a routine because she gave him that look like, okay, they gone. Come on in. And he proceeds to smash Bobby's little sister to smithereens. And immediately I'm thinking, okay, they got to be 17, 18, 16, something like that. They all got to be around that same age because I'm like, okay, how old are they? The little, the little sister probably got to be a few years younger than them because I'm like, whoa, time out. What is this series telling us about Dennis? <laughs> so I'm guessing they're only a few years apart and they're teenagers doing the do. Okay, so as they're doing the do, you know, Shy, he going back over to Bobby house to go pick up the gun that he used earlier. And he's banging on the window, banging on the door. Ain't nobody answering, so he just waiting. He just waiting at the front of the house. And as he's waiting, he hears somebody voice, and he tries like duck and hide. And he looks in, and he sees Dennis, and he like, oh snap! So then he gets a shovel, like, all right, if this brother come out, I'm smashing his head, and I'm gonna kill him right here. So as he does that, preparing to hit him, he looks in the window and sees Dennis and Bobby's little sister kissing, and he looks like. The same way that the viewers were like, how old is this girl? How old is the sister? And he is just floored. Like, what in the world is going on? So as Dennis proceeds to go to the front of the house, Shy's already gone. And he sees the shovel just kind of laying there on the porch. So clearly he's gone and he's out of there. And Dennis is thinking nobody knows that little secret. He cut to the last scene. You got Dennis and you got Bobby in the basement air area they're looking at tv they listening to music talking all this stuff and dennis is just like man i'm gonna find who tried to blast me i'm gonna figure this out and bobby's just like 
you know, let's just focus on the music. Let's just do this music thing because I think it's really going to work out. And he says, nah. He's like, just just find just find this certain record for me. And Dennis is looking through the vinyl and moving the crates. And as he's moving the crates, he finds the gun that Bobby stashes for shot. And he's like, yo, man, where you get this? And Bobby like, oh, he got this look like, oh, no. And he's like, this is what I need to get back at them fools that tried to get at me. This is what we need right here. And you're just like, oh, here we go. And that was the last of the episode. What did you think? I thought it was packed with so much information <laughs> that my review would have been super, super, super long. But we know coming off that all of the characters involved that we're seeing, they know of each other. The people that are shooting at each other, they know of each other. They know where each other lives. We got certain people in relationships that develop. We know that certain characters grew up together. So I like how they're allowing us to learn who the characters are slowly and learning who they are and building the emotion of what's happening. So we know in episode one that <laughs> Shy and Power wanted to kill um, Dennis, but we haven't learned that yet. So we can assume that we're going to learn that in the second episode. Will we find out, for those who are not Wu-Tang fans, how old the sister was when they were doing the do? Because clearly all of y'all are friends and you're having sex with your friend's younger sister. How is that going to work out? Let me know what you thought of this first episode. Did you like it? You didn't like it? Subscribe. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss any posts. And follow me on Instagram at the same profile name, officialbun underscore E. I know there's a few things that I might have missed, but I wanted to make sure that in this review that I stated the very, very important scenes that meant a lot. So yes, there are other things that happened, but they weren't critical. So let me know what you what you thought. I mean, I thought it was nice. I'm excited to review the second episode. So keep posted. Look, you already gave me the view. The view. You might as well subscribe so you can know what's next. I'll let y'all later. Bye.